add value to your business or do you want to just be this administrative person? And often if you look at your talent team and the caliber of talent in your company, they correlate. You could hire the best person for the job if they were in your candidate pool. All these individual employees, one by one by one, together, their voices all come together to articulate the culture of the company. Hiring on, all Hiring on all cylinders. Hello, hello, all of you out there in podcast land. Rob Stevenson once more for Hiring on All Cylinders, and I am podcasting from my makeshift booth here at Fidelity HQ in Boston, Massachusetts, where I am situated being the podcast of record for our friends at Future Workplace. Joining me right now is Dan Schauble. He is the partner and research director at Future Workplace, former top 30 under 30 recipient. He is a best-selling author of Promote Yourself, the new rules for career success, as well as Me 2.0, Four Steps to Building Your Future. You can check out his columns both on Forbes and Time. Dan, thanks so much for being here. Happy to be here. Exciting day. Absolutely. It's uh, kind of nonstop for you. So thank you for, uh, for finding the time to, to do this with me. Pleasure. Really looking forward to talking with you. So I, uh, I read a bunch of your columns in, an, in advance of speaking with you. And one that I was most excited about was your predictions on the upcoming trends in, in our space over the next year. Um, so you wrote that you expect that there will see walls come down between HR marketing and CS. There's a whole uh, the rise of the gig economy. I kind of want to just plow through as much as that as we can and pick your brain. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think we should start with uh, candidate and employee experience. Sure. And it's basically over the years. I'm a marketer. That's where I come from. So to me, these trends are very natural, and it always has made sense to me that why not use the same strategies that you use to create a great customer experience for candidates and for employees. Right. And so we set out and we did two different studies, one on the candidate experience. And what we found in the candidate experience is if you give a, uh, candidates a bad experience, meaning that if they submit a resume, they don't hear back at all, they're, they will never apply for another job at your company ever. Right. And remember, this person who applies might be 23 years old, and then when they're 40, they might be an incredibly talented professional in a position that's hard to hire for, and then you have no chance with them. They still have that bad taste in their mouth. They're like, exactly. oh, th those are those people that never got back to me. And so, and not only that, but because of the world we live in now, that individual could write a negative Glassdoor review. Yep. They could post something on their blog. They could tweet something. And so that negative experience, just like when you think about a consumer's negative experience of having poor service at a restaurant will, will be pushed online and shared to not just one person that they might talk about, to one-on-one, -on -one, but to maybe thousands of people, and it will really impact the brand, not just from an employment perspective, but also from a consumer perspective, because branding is branding, right? Exactly. And, uh, and then from the employee experience, a lot of what we've talked about today, the first few speakers from Fidelity actually focus on the employee experience. And what's really fascinating is, over the past maybe uh, 48 months, what we've seen is that more companies, especially the bigger companies, are really focusing on employee experience and they have people who have titles that say, you know, director of employee experience, manager of employee experience. I, I actually just introduced one of those from Fidelity today and to me that's uh, really profound and interesting, especially because that's the focus for Gene and Kevin's book, The Future Workplace Experience, and it's probably the biggest or one of the biggest trends in HR now and so we really want to capture that in the trend because we see it moving forward more because you know, retention is the number one challenge next year. And retention has a lot to do with what you work on with recruiting, but also has to do with, you know, how much are people being compensated fairly? Do they have the right employee benefits package? Do they have the right training and support from are their they manager? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of factors to this. You know, employee engagement might be the buzzword of 2016, but what goes into it is what's really important. Once you go deeper and you see, hey, you know, if we don't create a good employee experience, you, you have globally 86% of employees worldwide who are disengaged. And for my generation of millennials, it's the highest out of that percentage. And so companies really have to take this seriously because next year is 100%, and this goes into another trend, going to be the war for talent. Right. right. Quit rates are increasing. The economy's back. It's about 5% unemployment right now. It's going to continue to get better is, is what we're predicting. And because of that, uh, people have options, right? right? And this actually goes into the gig economy trend as well. Everything's connected. 
And one of the options that people have is to just be a freelancer instead of a full-time employee. And it saves companies money, and it's created this whole new blended workforce of full-time employees working with uh, freelancers and the complications that that creates because this is something new. It's not like you go to college and you get trained on how to be a freelancer or as a full-time employee, how to interact and manage a freelancer. And so those are new complications and challenges, but also opportunities for companies in order to you know, leverage an on-demand workforce to solve their greatest new problems. Definitely. I'm starting to see how it all kind of hangs together. So for the gig economy example, you have these people on the other side who are hired specifically as employee engagement manager. And so freelancers would presumably fall under their purview. So does it have an effect on employee culture and morale though? It does. And there's two things that I've been thinking about a lot lately. One is the number one reason why, and we've done three studies on this globally and nationally, and the number one reason why people want to be part of the gig economy is for freedom and flexibility. That's right. number one by far, meaning that their full-time job with benefits does not offer flexibility. So they choose to freelance because that creates immediate flexibility for them. Because it's... It, as a freelancer, it's be- less about where you are and how much time you spend and more about the work it's itself, which right. is the future of work. It's actually the work instead of location, time, the time when you start working and the duration of how long you work. And so that that's the reason why people choose it because they're making less money doing it. We did a study in May that came out and it found that the average you know, income for someone who's a freelancer is like a little bit less than $30,000 a year. So they're not making more money, it's just what they prioritize is different. And so it's a signal for companies who want to hire more. It's not like companies are going to hire fewer full-time employees in the future, but it's a signal that flexibility is important. And only a third of companies have flexible programs. And to me, the biggest trend above everything in terms of employee benefits, in terms of how companies need to kind of think about recruiting and retaining the next generation of worker Globally, we found that flexibility is more important than healthcare coverage this year. And so to me, flexibility is really the key. It's uh, right now, it, in a sense, it's a competitive advantage. We're going to look back by, by 2020 and every company will have to embrace it. Otherwise, they're going to lose the war for talent. That's what I was about to ask. So by flexibility, you mean someone is saying, look, I don't need to be in a cubicle at 8 a.m. in rural Americana you know, for 50 hours a week to do this job. So they're choosing to kind of backlash a little bit and be a freelancer. So do you then expect companies to sort of react to that? And instead of continuing to employ high numbers of freelance people to working flexibility into the agreement with their full-time employees? So I think that's part of it, but I think it's, it's a very deeper issue because when you say flexibility, people immediately connect that to remote Uh, working or telecommuting right right? and it's not true flexibility could be arriving and at the workplace at 10 o'clock and leaving at seven o'clock flexibility could be telecommuting working at a co-working space working at home working at a coffee shop Uh, it could be spending a percentage of your time just like at google on work that's outside of your job description it could be having an extended lunch during the day Flexibility means different things to different people, and I think that's a really important conversation to have because once you start saying that flexibility is just telecommuting, there's fear and anxiety from the employer standpoint of losing control. Right. And there is something to be said, and I've thought a lot about this, even though I work from home for over five years, that working in the office for many tasks, for many, for many types of people, is really effective, right? Because it keeps you accountable. You're able to brainstorm effectively with people, uh, which, which is valuable. But I think there's something to be said about the office of the future, and we have a study coming out about that soon, too. The office of the future, of course, will use a lot of technology, but at the same time, the office of the future has to play to everyone's learning styles and how they best do work. So when you start to walk into these new modern offices, it's not just welcome to your cubicle or welcome to your open office space. There's huddle rooms, there's lounges, there's cafeterias. There are different... Uh, it, you don't have to have the same day every day. And I right. think that is where we're going. I do, we are the, um, despite the technological revolution, the actual office space is going nowhere. We just need to modernize it to take advantage of how people work. I love it. 
I could definitely keep hearing about this all day. I don't want to keep you though. This has been amazing. I, I do you, talk to me was just an example. Obviously flexibility takes into account a huge number of things and that's very important to me too. So I'm glad to hear you think that it's going to wind up a, a standard at companies in the next few years. I'm very hopeful. This has been awesome. Dan Shawball, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.